Okay, um, so today I'll be talking about persuasion versus incentives. And I'll also uh, start introducing the notion of various ways one can represent information, which I'm going to come back to during the second lecture on, on Sunday. So suppose we have two people. There's Anne and there's Bob. And Anne cares about what Bob's going to do. Okay, so for some reason, he's going to be the one taking the action. There's some action space A. Okay, Bob's going to be taking an action. And Anne's welfare depends on what Bob does. There's obviously hundreds of situations relevant to economics that have this ingredient in there. Okay, one person caring about what the other person does. Okay, well, how is Bob going to think about his decision? Okay, the simplest thing is to think that he has some utility over the action he's going to take. All right, so if that's all there is, and he's just maximizing, taking the element of A that maximizes this utility function, obviously his, his problem is very straightforward. And Anne just sitting there looking, observing, potentially unhappy about what he's going to do because she might care about what he does. She has her own utility function over his action. And without any contracts, without any means of influence, we might not get to a desirable outcome because there's no reason to assume that Bob's utility is necessarily the same as hers and that his unilaterally optimal choice will be, will be um, improving her welfare. So how do we, what are some, some of the simplest things that Anne might do to try and change what Bob is going to do? Okay, well first, clearly we're gonna need to, to have any hope of something changing. We're gonna have to consider the fact that his behavior must be driven by something other than just this U of A. Okay. And probably the largest class of interventions we could think about is that there's other things he cares about, which we can denote by T, T say for transfer, okay? And maybe she can, she can pay him to do what she wants him to do, okay? Or maybe T is not for transfer, T is for threat. Maybe she will force him to do, okay, what he wants to do because he doesn't like being punished and she has some method of punishment. Maybe T is her own action and maybe this is a repeated relationship and maybe there's maybe some reciprocity, okay? But in general, what a lot of incentive theory is about is about structuring some way for one person to influence another person's action by thinking about some sort of transfers that change the marginal utility of the action that, that we care about, about the element of the say. Okay, so there is some marginal utility, okay, some way in which u varies with a. This a need not be a one-dimensional variable, so maybe that's bad notation, okay. Some way in which the, the in which, um, Bob's utility is affected, and any attempt to change a marginal utility, we might want to call incentives. Okay, that let, let just, for purposes of, 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 of today, let's just define incentives as that way of changing behavior. So, so far, all, I'm, all I want to do is set up a taxonomy. Okay, I want to I distinguish between incentives and persuasion. And the way in which they're different is that when we're going to be talking about persuasion, we're going to be talking about how to influence people's behavior through information, we're explicitly defining it as being not this sort of um, approach. Okay, so we're not going to be thinking about changing marginal utilities. Instead, the study of persuasion, the study of information design, is interested in settings when there's some uncertainty about something. There's a state space. There's something that people don't know about. Okay. And the fact that Bob might not know exactly what the state of the world is means that his marginal utility from a given action or his optimal action might change depending on what he thinks about the unknown state of the world. Okay? And then you can obviously see that there's, there's any, obviously the difference here is that Anne doesn't get to choose the state. We can't kind of set out, okay, the way we could set out thinking about what kind of transfers I could give you in exchange for an action What's going to be different here, okay, the way in which mathematics is going to look different than mathematics of optimal contracts, that we don't think of a state as a choice variable. 
We think of it as something that's out there fixed in the world that we don't necessarily know at the outset. In fact, if we did know it, it would be a bit trivial. We would have no, no levers. Okay? And please don't hesitate to interrupt with clarifying or um, other sorts of questions. All right, so that's going to be the distinction between incentives and persuasion. I want to talk a bit about the structure of studying persuasion, namely studying one person trying to influence another, where we explicitly at the outset shut off transfers, and we think about influences all happening through influence on the beliefs about some state of the world. Okay, now, of course, you could put both in there. I didn't have to erase the T before I put in the omega. All right. In fact, Ben's going to be talking, I believe, on Sunday about some of the problems and some of the approaches to studying a uh, combination of information design and mechanism design. Okay. Information design, mechanism design, very loosely you can think of them as some kind of sort of analogs of incentives versus persuasion. It's not quite right. Okay. It's not quite a, a clean isomorphism. Okay. But right now I'm going to be, I'm, I'm sort of be introducing persuasion as one of the examples of what, what, what we'll think of as, as information design more broadly, and, and Ben will talk more about that later, later this morning. Okay, so let's think about a, a, um, a persuasion problem. We have the state space, okay, and we start off with some common prior about the state space, okay. Mu naught is an element of the distributions over omega, okay, so this is the prior belief. And even if we're going to think about environments where Ann might actually know more than the Bob, we can still sort of, this has the sta been standard approach in game theory for a long time, start off with there being some common prior and perhaps she'll learn the state and he won't and she'll have some ways of conveying what she's learned, etc. But we have some initial at the sort of, you know, uh, uh, the, the beginning of, 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 of the world distribution over these states. And at the outset, we'll think for sure, Bob, that's the only thing he knows. He just knows the initial distribution of the states. Okay, now a lot of models in information economics in the mid-70s and mid-80s concern particular methods of information transfer, particular methods of Anne influencing Bob when she knows the state and he doesn't, and their technological constraints on what can she say given what she knows? Okay, so I'm not going to give a whole overview of that strategic communication literature, but I'd like to understand sort of, I'd like for everybody to be on the same page as to where what I'll be talking about stands in relation to that. So, so if, if you think about, just to make things concrete, think about a cheap talk game. So Crawford Sobel, 1982. I say Anne has observed a state. She knows it. And she can send any message she wants Okay, Anne sends a message to Bob, and this message is entirely unconstrained in a sense it doesn't enter anybody's utility function. It's just a, a, a choice. We could now, of course, as long as there's, these are not entirely opposed uh, utility functions, we can think about, well, how much can Anne change Bob's belief through the messages that she sends? And of course, a key constraint is going to be some kind of a incentive compatibility constraint, which is if we have an influential equilibrium and the messages actually influence what Bob does. That means these messages actually uh, convey information about the state. We need to make sure that, in fact, Anne wants to send the message we're saying she's going to send in equilibrium. Okay? But that, that is a form of persuasion where, as we'll see, we can think of this incentive compatibility constraint as a, as a shrinking of the set of set of set of information environments, set of signals that can be conveyed. Okay, I'll talk about that in a moment. Of course, we didn't have to do cheap talk, right? There are other models like this. Some are the ones where this message is a verifiable message. It doesn't have to uh, be exactly equal to the state, but it has to be constrained by the state in some way. Like, for example, the state has to be inside the message and so on, all right? There are signaling models where any message is allowed but which one you get to send depends on what the truth, uh, how costly they are depends on, on what the truth is and so on. But all of those, my claim is going to be, are going to have the feature that in equilibrium, whether it's an equilibrium of a cheap down game or a signaling game or a verifiable message game, if we step back and look at the equilibrium, whatever Anne said to Bob, 
whether it was by getting a lot of education in the signaling game or, or just saying something in the cheap dog game, what she said and how that in equilibrium related to omega was information. Okay, so now I want to just take a small step aside and just talk about formalizing information. Okay. So I'm going to think about what is information. We're, we're, we fix the state space, we fix the prior. Okay. Information is going to be the joint distribution of truth and data. Okay, so this is truth. Okay, which we can think of what in, in, in the three kind of models I discussed, something that Anne knows exactly at the outset. And this is data. These are the signal realizations. Okay, so this is the thing that in our setting Bob gets to observe. So always and everywhere we can think of information as some relationship between what was actually true and what was observed. And I'm going to throughout kind of always think of in the background, however else we might represent information is just some instantiation of this object. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we can, without referencing a particular game, like the cheap dog game or a verifiable message game or the signaling game, we could say, well, we don't know yet that we'll be able to get there, but if we think about, if we're going to be in equilibrium, and Anne is going to understand the relationship between what she heard and what Anne knew, then surely we'll be the maximum payoff that Anne can get across any of these games must look something like this. She's going to be choosing, suppose for a moment she can choose, and then we can discuss some settings where she might be able to choose. She's going to be choosing, so this is meant to be like a little curly pie. That's the element, okay? That is, the, that is an example of a signal structure or an experiment in black horse terms, or, or, or uh, there's lots of equivalent terms that get used there. This is this joint distribution with truth and data. There's a set of all of them. What is this capital pi? It's just delta of omega cross s. And you can think of, pick any s you'd like. We'll have some results that without loss of generality, this s, the s does not need to be very big. In particular, we'll be able to restrict attention to s, which is no bigger than the minimum of the state space and the action space. But that's just an aside for now. Okay, we're, we're maximizing pi over pi. And then we're... We're thinking about maximizing now. Anne is the one providing information. We'll, we'll uh, depart from that in a moment. But she cares about this V of A. Okay, she might care about V of A omega. But we have to have now, of course, some map as to how does this, how is this influenced by this? Okay, there's going to be obviously some expectations out here because what data is generated depends on this. And we could start expanding this problem so we could start saying well there's got to be from this Bob's utility U there has to be some a star of mu sub s okay what is mu sub s it's the posterior belief that you go from you go from the prior to the posterior based on what signal was generated and what signal realization you saw. This A star of mu sub s is going to be the arg max, the best action. It has to be some action that's optimal for Bob given that he observes some piece of information from some information structure. Okay, is that clear? Do I need to write this out more explicitly? Um, well, for, for, so it's going to turn out in this simple problem where we have just Ann and Bob, we have a single receiver. It's going to turn out that if we, if we have multiple, so one thing we'll be able to talk about, this is the expectation under the sig of S, sorry, expectation, I can write it this way, expectation under pi of V of A star of mu sub S Omega. 
okay, where this s and omega have a joint distribution under pi. And what Ben's question is, I, I wrote it as if it were a function, not a correspondence. Okay. Now it's going to turn out that if this is what the problem looks like, and we're looking for, uh, and if there are multiple optimal actions that n is not indifferent about, the very fact that we're looking for the equilibrium of this game, if we think of it as a game where n chooses pi and then Bob chooses his action, the equilibrium condition is going to pick out uniquely, well not necessarily uniquely, but it's going to pick out the action that is optimal for n, for the center. Okay, we can't have as, as an equilibrium a situation where this action is, is one of multiple optimal actions Sorry, is one of multiple optimal actions for, for Bob, but not the one that's optimal for Ann. Because under that, if, if this A star is not optimal for the sender, for Ann, this V will not be upper semi-continuous, and we might, we're not going to necessarily have a solution to this problem. Okay? So we can usually, without loss of generality, restrict our attention to the, to the indifferences being broken in the, in, the, in the favor of the sender. But I didn't want to get into the weeds of that yet, but that's okay. It's good. I appreciate some questions. I'm getting a little nervous that no one's asking anything, so I have no idea if I'm being way too slow or uh, everything's totally unclear. So more questions will help me calibrate myself. Okay. Not sure the best test subject, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we could start solving these kinds of optimization problems. Now, one thing to note, to go back before we start into the, get into the, into the mathematics of solving problems like this, Sometimes the game form that we write down, namely something like the cheap dog game, the verifiable uh, message game, the signaling game, is <clears throat> well, especially the cheap dog game and the verifiable game, there's no cost to messages, it's just constraints of messages. There's a sense in which not all of these pies will be available because we'll have IC constraints. Okay, so for right now, I want to say if we just throw those out of the window and we just think about, well, whatever information is being generated, okay, there will be some posterior formed, okay, given the fact that Bob in equilibrium understands what is the information being generated, okay, we're going to be solving a problem like this. Now, I, one of the things we emphasize in some of the early work on is there's lots of environments we think, yes, Eric. Bob, okay, Bob's IC constraints are here. They're already built in. Now, the question is, if I, there's one way to think about this, but there's a game, which is the game I'm going to be talking about, when Anne just gets to pick any information structure she wants. And that's the game I'm studying. So when I'm simply connecting this to the other games, where, say, Anne gets to just, instead of choosing an arbitrary information structure, she just sends the, a cheap talk message. Now, it's not true that she can generate any one of these she'd like. Then she has, there's a sender IC constraint in cheap dog game, which means not all information structure, not all the information she'd like to reveal, can she reveal in equilibrium. So usually, so suppose for a moment, just to fix ideas, she has actions are just, just a real number, and she just, and, 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 and she has, she just always wants the higher action, okay? Then there's a sense in which the, 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 what information structures we can get will be almost fully determined by the I signals. In a cheap talk game, we're never going to be able to get any information in a game like this. Okay, so it's a limitation on what you can say. I mean, you could imagine a more complicated it's, it's the in which she could, she could send uh, more complicated signals. Yes, yeah, so I guess what I'm was simply, so maybe the terminology in calling this IC constraint is, is not helpful. What I, what I wanted to just clarify is that I, I want to for now talk about, and in fact, about what happens if you get to choose any information structure whatsoever. 
And the difference between that and the kind of thing that you have under cheap talk and verifiable engine and so on is that you have a restriction to what information can be generated that comes from sender's incentives. Here, this capital pi that we're maximizing over, V is not in there. And we could also think of, if we think about going across various uh, mechanisms for communication, the set of effective information that can be conveyed is going to be some function of V. All right, so, but suppose you want to solve this problem. One problem that we might have is that this is a pretty big space. The set of all distributions over the state space and the signal realization space. And if you try and sort of do this in a um, sort of knee-jerk reaction and start writing this out and start taking derivatives and setting derivatives equal to zero, it might not be the most productive approach, okay? Because this space that you're maximizing over, especially once you have more than a couple of states, um, is, is, is sort of gets, gets quickly complicated. Things are not necessarily continuous in this space. Um, and so what I really want to talk about is transforming this maximization problem. And this will be first out of the couple of ways I want to transform it over the course of the two lectures. But the first I want to talk about is, uh, is one which has been, which is I think the, the most useful. So the thing I want to note is that as we've already discussed, okay, if we pick a signal, an information structure, and we get a signal observation, we get a posterior. Okay, a posterior is an element of delta omega. Okay, that means that if we pick a signal, okay, we can think of this as inducing a distribution over these posteriors because for every, a signal induces a distribution over signal realizations. For every those signal realizations, we have a posterior. So from the ex-ante perspective, a signal induces a distribution over beliefs. Okay? And it's going to turn out, it'll be very helpful to think of signals as distributions of posteriors. Okay, I'm going to just start with some very simple observations about this mapping. Okay, and I will often use a letter like tau to be an element, and I'll stop using an element of delta delta omega, and I will sometimes use the notation, I'm going to say that the bracket pi equals tau if the distribution of posteriors induced by the signal pi is tau. Clear? Okay, so let's talk a bit about some of the taus that we get. First thing to note is, again, we have our prior mu naught that's given. Suppose we pick some, suppose we pick some pi and we want to know what is the expectation given the distribution of posteriors induced by this pi of mu sub s, just of mu sub s. If I, te if I haven't told you what pi I've picked, can you answer this question? Okay, if, and what is the answer? Prior. It's the prior, okay? The expected posterior equals the prior, and that's true, of course, for all pi's, okay? Moreover, not only is it true that whenever you pick any information structure, the expected posterior equals the prior, the converse, so to speak, also holds. Okay, so we have a result. Give me some distribution of posteriors such that the expectation is the prior, there exists a signal that induces that distribution of posteriors. Okay, it's an unsurprising result, Maybe you might call it obvious, basically prove it just by inverting Bayes' rule. Okay, but it's an important result for us because it means we can move freely to the extent we're in this world 
where it's only the posterior that influences the objective function, okay, and the distribution of that posterior with the state, we can move freely between thinking about choosing an information structure and choosing a distribution of posteriors. Because if I find some distribution of posteriors, of course, it better be on average equal to the prior, that I really like, I don't need to worry, I know I'll be able to find some way of getting there. So we can transform this problem into this problem. which I want to discuss, has a, um, has a nicer uh, interpretation. Sorry, and this is not expectation under tau. Okay. So the first thing to note is that if you tell me mu sub s, I still don't, I know what, what, what action Bob's going to do. So I, know, so I know that, I know the A star. But I still have this omega over here. Okay. So I know how the posterior influences the receiver. I'm going to switch the language. This is going to be not receiver. This is be the sender. So S is now, sorry, stands for two things. Um, I guess I won't be using S. So this is just sender. And this is the receiver. So we need some way to get rid of this omega for this form formulation to be helpful. It's going to turn out that's actually pretty easy, okay? Because if I tell you that sender induced some distribution of beliefs, okay, and the realization was such that 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 receiver's posterior was 0.2, and therefore a star of 0.2 was taken. Do you already know how much sender likes that action? Well, you don't know omega. You don't know exactly what the state is. So is there, is there something that you know? Do you know anything about sender's beliefs? Do you know what sender is going to think of the state is when the receiver thinks the state is likely to, has a 20% chance of being right, let's say? What does the sender think at that point? The same. It has to be the same, right? There's a sense in which... Even from the ex ante perspective, I must have the same belief as, as the receiver. So we can define a function, let's say v hat of mu sub s, can be defined as the expectation under mu sub s of v of a star of mu sub s omega. Any yeah. We can get rid of the s. The s is totally unnecessary. It's now just an indicator. So v of v but hat of sure. <laughs> All right. It was clearly. Since it was everywhere, it's nowhere. Uh, it, it's needed nowhere. <laughs> so we, what is this? This is, we can think of this as the, as the sender's value function over the posterior beliefs induced. And the posterior belief enters the sender's value function twice. Once, because it influences what the receiver is going to do at once because it influences how, does, how much the sender like that. Okay? This is an easy, we'll go through a couple of concrete examples in, in, in a second, but this is often an easy function to compute given the primitives V, v and U. Okay? Any questions about, about this V hat of mu? This is a value function over beliefs. Okay? which belief matters because it changes what the receiver is going to do, and it might change also how much I like it. Given this definition, 
we can write out our problem is this problem. Okay, trying to maximize some function of posteriors. Expectation of v hat of mu subject just to the fact that the mu's on average are the prior. Okay, now it turns out that this kind of a problem has a very nice geometric interpretation, which has been known since the work on repeated games with asymmetric information by Alman and Mosler back in the 60s, okay, where we're going to be, be thinking about um, the, the way in which the, the, the shape of this function, okay, and this is especially helpful when the state space is small and we can visualize it, okay, teaches us about what sort of distributions are optimal. Okay, so let's go through a simple example of that. Well, actually, rather than example, let's go through a schematic. Okay, suppose now belief is just a one-dimensional variable, which is just saying suppose we have two states. Okay, so this is the probability of one of the states. And suppose my V looks something like this. Okay, and let's say my prior is here. Let's think about before we do the, 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 the max, let's just think about as we scan the set of all possible distribution of posteriors that are equal to the mean on average, what sort of values we get. Okay. Well, one thing I could do is give no information. That, that'll, that'll get us here. Okay. If I give no information, distribution of posteriors just to generate at the prior, and we get this payoff. I could also fully reveal the state. Let's say this is a mu of 1, in which case... I'm going to be either getting this or getting that. And on average, I'll be getting something like that. Of course, I could give out some partial information, give out, get distribution of beliefs that looks like that. And on average, my belief would be this. And this would be my, my expected payoff, because I either get this payoff or this payoff, and this would be my average payoff. So what you immediately see is that if I start taking combination of points in this value function and look at where they intersect this vertical line, which is no longer so vertical, okay, this vertical line, that's telling me what my payoff, what my payoffs can be. It will have to be some intersection of this vertical line and the convex hull of the graph of the value function. And where those meet is actually very easily seen to be at the concavification of the value function. If you take the smallest concave function that's everywhere above the value function, okay, and you make your lines vertical. I guess I moved my mu knot. Here it is. Okay. This is the best information structure, all right? Or this is the payoff that you get from the best information structure. And, uh, and, and of course, this argument did not rely on this V having this particular shape. This is just a, an example. Now, another thing that's important is that when we had this claim that said, given tau, there's a pi that does it, it's important that this argument not just be some fixed point kind of proof that just tells us, well, surely there must be some information structure. The reason why it's very helpful that this proof is constructive is then this proof also tells us once you find the tau, once you find the distribution of posteriors, you're like, you can just roll it back and figure out, well, what's the information structure? What's the signal that gives that to you? So distribution of posteriors that's optimal here is going to be one that is either mu L or mu r, with obviously the probabilities of those two being just pinned down by the fact they're on average equal to mu naught. And then once I know that's the tau I want, I can go back to this proof and just say, well, what is the information structure that gives me that distribution of posteriors? And I have solved this problem. Okay? Questions? Why, why does it have to be that the mean is preserved? Why is this true? 
Okay, so that's a that's a, a pretty basic feature of Bayesian updating is that <coughs> that it, it really it really the, the, the one line answer is the law of iterated expectations. I don't know if I can I, I think that really does suffice. Law of iterative expectation tells you to expect the posterior has to equal the prior. Okay, you can condition all of the events that could happen, they lead to these posteriors, and it has to be that when I average my posterior, it comes out to what it is uh, at the outset, then be the prior event. Yeah, exactly. That's another way of putting it. Here the state is fixed. So obviously if, if, if you, one way that this would fail, well, one generalization when this isn't the case is where, is, is, is in quantum mechanics. Okay, so we are, this is a, this is, this is a Newtonian persuasion problem. Um, actually just on Google Scholar the other day, I saw someone doing some kind of persuasion using quantum beliefs. I, I, I don't know any, uh, what, what they're doing, but I was intrigued. Uh, okay. So let's, let's talk through a very simple example of this, and then we'll talk about generalizations of this. So probably the, the, the simplest persuasion problem we could write down is one where there's, say, two states, left and right. There are two actions, left and right. Okay, And it's going to turn out we can make our signal realization space. Um, I've run out of ways of writing this. I'll, uh, for a moment, and I'll see why that's not such a bad thing to do. Use the same letters for the signalization and the and the state. Okay, so maybe maybe it takes a second for me to um, maybe maybe it's good to just take a small detour and and write this uh, first this this general result before we go into this example, which I which I mentioned offhandedly, which is suppose you're maximizing a problem and choosing the optimal information structure. Remember pi. Delta omega cross S. This S is part of the thing that you get to choose. It's not given to you at the outset by the problem. And there's a claim which is without loss of generality, you can set S such that the cardinality of S is um, equal to the minimum the cardinality of the action space and the cardinality of the state space. Okay, and this is really a, a combination of two results, namely that you never need more signalization than there's actions, and another separate argument for all you don't need more signalization than, than, than there's states. Yeah? No, so remember, we're, we're gi at the outset, when you describe the problem, you told me the U, the V, the state space and the prior. That's what I'm given at the outset, right? And the action space, okay? S is something which is not given to me at the outset. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about possible information structures. And possible information structures are going to say, what is the set of things that could be observed? This is a set of signal realizations, the set of data that are possible to see, and then some relationship between truth and data. I'm saying when, when if you're trying to think about information structures that are optimal in the setting, you can, without loss of generality, pick one that's small relative to the smaller, or that's no, no bigger than the smaller of the action space and the state space. Okay. The fact you don't need to be bigger than the action space is, uh, can be shown basically through revelation principle type of argument. Okay, we can think about signal realizations that are basically recommendations of actions to take. And the same kind of argument that should be familiar with from other sort of applications of uh, revelation principle 
And mechanism design tells you if I have multiple signalizations and they are suggesting the same action, I won't be hurt by basically combining those and not distinguishing between them. So this is why you don't need more signalization that there's actions. The reason why you don't need more uh, signalization than there's states, because sometimes the action spaces can be quite big, okay, and the state space might be small, is really easily seen from the geometry of concavification, okay? And it basically follows from Teodori's theorem, okay? The fact that if you think about how many points you need to, um, to create, the, uh, uh, to, have, to have their convex um, hull cover the space, it does, you don't need anything more than the dimensionality of the, of the space that you're in, okay? But that's, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to just remember this result, and therefore that in a setting like this, it's without loss of generality. We're going to think about with, with two, two states and two actions, we can think about there being two possible observations that we're going to get. Suppose that the utility of the receiver okay, is very straightforward. Utility of A omega is equal to 1 if the action equals the state and suppose that the utility of the sender is equal to 1 if action equals R. Oh, I, had, I did, so yes, I did. Uh, action equals <laughs> no, I'm not joking. <laughs> yeah, sorry. If you, if you guess correctly, yeah. Good. So now it's easy to see. Remember, we have from this, we can write down our v hat of mu. Okay, v hat of mu is going to have a very simple form. There's going to be some beliefs for which we're going to get the action 1 and get a payoff of 1, and some beliefs we're going to get action of 0. Okay, and those will be since because of based on the symmetry exactly where the belief is equal to one half. And as I was arguing earlier, we can make this an open circle and this a closed circle, because if we tried, of course, we could we could make our receiver break different in differences differently, but if we do that, we won't have a, a, a um, upper semi-continuous function here, and we're, our, our maximization problem is going to be undefined, which means that the only way of breaking differences that's compatible with equilibrium is, is the one that's under preferred. Okay? So in this simple example, let's suppose for a moment that the prior is equal to 0.3. Okay. The concavification argument tells us, okay, you, you want, this is where colors are useful, but that's your, that's your concavification, and your payoff is going to be right here, and the beliefs that you're going to be inducing are 0 and 1 half. Are there colored, is there colored chalk? Oh, there is a little bit. To use some purple, you know, that's good enough. I'll regret this when I won't erase in a second. All right, so we're going to have these these two beliefs induced. Okay, that's the way you get this congregation. Either the posterior is going to be zero, or the posterior is going to be going to be one half. So what I want to pause now a bit is talk about the interpretation of both this solution and the interpretation of the general problem of choosing any information structure whatsoever. Okay? So the way that I think about it is there are there is not a single class of environments where choosing any information structure might be a, um, a reasonable thing to consider. 
and the set of environment where, where one set of environments where that's the case is where we have um, some kind of an ex ante design of the institution. And this is why the you know, term information design is often sort of attached to this, as you can think of it as being mechanism design, as I'm building a particular institutional structure where this is the game that's going to get played. I'm building an institutional structure where regardless of which of these states realizes, we will be getting these signals. Let's first talk about what these signals are. So if you, if you were to now go from this tau back to pi, the pi that you would get is optimal. It's going to be probability of r given r is equal to 1. And the probability of r given l is equal to 3 7 Okay? Just turns out you can, I'm not going to do the, the, the algebra for you. If you plug that in, you don't get this distribution of posteriors. Okay, that means when the state is the one that the sender is happy about, he always reveals that for sure. When the state is the one he doesn't like, he lies toward the other state, lies in quotation marks, three-sevenths of the time. Of course, this three-sevenths was picked. I mean, one way to think about how this is going to happen, let's, let's think of this for a moment as just some number q. Okay, and if we plot Q here, keeping this fixed, we can ask ourselves, what's the probability of um, probability of R given R? Okay, what's the what's the posterior when you see this this uh, this this high signal? Okay, and that's obviously going to be a function of Q. When Q is equal to zero, okay, when you never lie. What's this equal to? What is it? Hmm? One, right? Yes, people say count two. Okay, so I'm never lying. R is sent probably one here, we're probably zero in L, so we have one. Okay, what about if we go to Q equal to one? Okay. Then we get down to point three because there was no information conveyed. Okay. And obviously in between, it's some decreasing function. And where this three-sevenths comes is we know we need it to be at point five or higher for you to actually get the high action when the state is R. Otherwise, you're getting the, the low action always. And it turns out that this intersection happens exactly at three-sevenths. Okay. So that's one way you could... Do the algebra if you if you wanted to. So, what are some examples of 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 of, of institutional settings where you might be able to commit to always give the high grade when the situation is good and give the high grade some of the time when the situation is bad? One has to do with in a sense, one interpretation I like has to do with the very kind of physical nature of information generation. So one story we tell in our first paper on this is sender is a prosecutor. He always wants to send a person to jail. R means guilty. L means innocent. 30% okay? of people are guilty. Okay? So the prosecutor always wants conviction. The judge... I guess you can think of it as a civil trial, which won't work because in a moment I'm going to give a murderer example. Uh, I guess it's the civil trial of O.J. Simpson, something like that. So a civil trial regarding murder. He just wants to convict if the probability of guilt is more or less than a half. You might say, well, how would, how would in a setting like that a prosecutor ever be able to generate a signal like this? Like what would that mean? What would that mean physically? Like if you're a prosecutor and... You hire an analyst and he tells you, you know, this is the information you want to generate. Like what, like what kind of an argument would, would give that? So I'm going to give just a very simple, concrete example, just as our first example uh, out of many as to, as to how you get to control the information environment. Suppose that, there, that we have, that we know, we have the, the uh, from the, scene of the crime, we have the blood of the person who is the, the perpetrator. So we have that. We have a sample, and we could do a DNA test on it. 
we could do a you know test of whether it's blood type A plus, A minus, uh, A positive, A negative, and so on. Uh, but you don't have to. The whole idea is the prosecutor here. Um, obviously, you might worry about the defense. We'll talk about that on Sunday. We'll have some multiple senders. For today, we have only the prosecutor. The defense here is realistically completely inept. Um, so he gets to commission any test that he wants. And suppose he says, well, we know that the, the, the blood type of the, of the perpetrator is, is A. In fact, we might also know that it's A positive, And we may also know, in fact, you know, the whole sequence of the DNA. We might know all kinds of things about this test. But it says, all I want you to do is figure out whether my defendant's blood type is A or not. That's it. That's what, that, that's what my, my, my defendant is uncomfortable with revealing more information. Um, sorry, not defendant. The, 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 what I want you to do is, is, is not my defendant, but the defendant. Um, I, I, I don't want to impose on his privacy, so I, I don't want to learn about that. But I'd like to know whether he's blood type A. Okay? So what are the possible signalizations here? He might be blood type A, blood type B, or blood type O. So we don't quite have L or R, but it's going to turn out not to matter because blood type B and blood type O are, in a sense, going to be like L. They're going to be an indication of innocence, right? Because what's the chance that the defendant is blood type B and O uh, is not blood type B and O if he's guilty? Zero, right? Everybody who's guilty must be blood type A. So this will be our analog of R. This will be our analog of L. Okay. So everybody agree with this part? And then what is this going to be? What's the probability if the person's innocent that their blood type is A? Where would that come from? The general population. And you know what is the share of people of the general population blood type A? Three sevens. Okay, that was a contrived example, but it is in fact three sevens, so it worked perfectly. Okay, so this is an example of what would it mean to structure an informational environment. Another, yeah. Yeah. Good. To the extent, I mean, again, these little bits of work that I'm doing still have to be generating some kind of public, jointly interpretable information, and that, but that 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 would work. I I I like that observation. I think that's absolutely right. To the extent that there's 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 investigation, which as I as I do it, there's a drift in the martingale drift in the posteriors. Well, no drift. I mean, zero drift. There's a there's a uh, there's a Brownian motion of the posterior something, and I'm just gonna stop when we get to um, either of these two places and the fact that I've stopped is giving no information about the state because I haven't learned anything over and above what has been publicly revealed that would also that would also work yeah Moshe All I, it's not the value of this formula. This, this is not like, this doesn't necessarily, um, the idea here wasn't to say, let us go back and study those games in this new light. I did not, if I seem to suggest that, I did not mean to suggest that. I just wanted to, for context, put it in, put it next to those games, which you could think of as being about changing behavior through information, information only, but thinking of a very particular ways of generating information where what information can be generated is all tied up with what the preferences are. 
And I just want to say those are just examples. One, one thing you could also think of this as, even if there's no, even if you don't have this commitment power, you do know that you could think of this as, and this is going to be the robust prediction sort of way of thinking about this. If I don't know the details of the game, if I don't quite know what is the communication technology, but I do know we're in equilibrium, and I don't know whether we're playing the cheap dog game or the verifiable message game. I just don't know what game we're playing. I say, but I know that it's all persuasion. I know it's not incentives. This is the upper bound of the payoff that the sender is going to get across whatever one of those games we might be playing. Yeah? I'm just, I'm just studying what are the set of outcomes we can get where, informa where, where when behavior is just being influenced through information as opposed to through incentives, and this is the highest payoff. Thing. Another thing to note here is that this really, we don't have to think of these as two players in the game. We could also think of it as a, some kind of a, a social planner's problem. So perhaps Anne has her preferences and Bob has her preferences, but we're interested in something like maximizing the sum of their preferences, okay, as a social planner. Well, that's okay. We're just going to get some new welfare function of A omega, and we could think about how to maximize the, the social welfare here. So we're, we, we might just be doing, we might be saying we're evaluating institutions based on how much information they generate, and we can think about what is the best possible institution in terms of maximizing our social welfare function, okay, given the information it generates. We know how to go from the social objective function to the payoffs through this, through this approach. Yeah, so I, I, I would like to push you a bit more on that example, and in particular regarding the commitment assumption. Yeah. So if the prosecutor realized that this guy is, uh, blood type is A, they, they got as a good news, Ah, good. No, excellent. This is a great, this is a, this is a, let me try and transform your question into a, a more technical question, okay, which has a, which has a sharp answer, which is let's, let us change the game so that there are periods, okay, and the game is the sender chooses a signal in period zero. We all publicly observe the signal realization. And then, if he wants to, sender can generate another signal. But there's no commitment here. Okay, he, there's, these are arbitrary information structures, so I can obviously choose what is a clear relation between truth and data, but I can't commit to pi one. I get to choose any pi one I want after pi zero. Okay. A general result is that for any preferences, sender can choose a pi naught, which is optimal, so that he will even ex post generate no information after that. So it is not the case that following, the, let's go back to what this means in this example, okay, we end up here or here. Here, there's no point in generating more information. Here, I'm getting the outcome I want. I don't want to generate more information, so I don't want to generate more information. I'm not tempted to generate more information given the ex post realizations. And this turns out to be always true. Okay, it's never the case. Once I've picked the optimal information structure ex ante, it's not like given its ex post realization, now that I know that this belief realized, I might want to generate more. We don't need to assume temporal commitment to get this result. Good. I, we can talk about that. That's not going to change this. So we can, add, we can add some receiver private information about their preferences or about the state, uh, and nothing's going to change. And I was, I'm, in fact, planning to talk about that. Uh, but we agree for this example, there is no, there's no commitment problem. He doesn't want to add more information. But, but I'm saying that it's not just in the, Okay, so are you, are, you, are you saying it's not clear why this holds in general? Okay, so let me explain why it holds in general. Because it, it, it should be clear from the geometric solution why it holds in general. So here is our 
general utility function, okay, as opposed to a, an example. Um, and if we consider the concavification, one thing you'll note is that the distribution of posteriors that we get, this is our X post, we're either going to be here or here. But wherever we end up, it has to be the case that the value function equals the concavification of the value function. This has to be true for all beliefs that are in the support of the optimal distribution of posteriors. If that weren't the case, you'd want to generate more information. Right? There cannot be an optimum where these two are Okay, because now there's a better distribution of posteriors. But now think about that X post. X post, either we have this belief or we have this belief. Whatever belief we have, we are already, the, now, now this is our new prior. But at our new prior, the value function equals its concavification. When that's true at the prior, there's no, there's no reason you want to generate extra information. So this is why, in general, you don't need dynamic commitment. Yeah, is that clear now? Yeah. Good. So it seems like yeah. a critical um, feature of the model that gives the sender too many powers that the sender can't generate private information. All he can generate is information that will be publicly available to everyone. So you know, he can never condition the choice of the information structure that he uses on uh, additional information that will state other than the posterior. Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. And as soon as that's not the case, we have to turn to what I had been calling IC constraints, unfortunately, but whatever, whatever is the right term for it. We have to worry, we have to start interpreting the, the sender's action. What's nice about, what, what makes the set of models tractable is that when we think about what the receiver is going to do, it's entirely driven by the, by the information structure that was chosen. Who chose it and why? is of no relevance. There's no sort of interpreting the motives of others in, in this approach. And as soon as there's that private information leakage, now we have to actually worry about the, the receiver has to care about what the sender wants. Here the, sender, the sender's preferences are of no interest to the receiver. He does not care whether this was generated in order to try and sway in one way or another or was done totally at random. Right? There's no skepticism of any kind. Okay, so, no, so if he knew the truth before he got to commission the experiment, this obviously would not, would not work. Because he would now be tempted when the guy is guilty, okay, well, oh, sorry, right, exactly, so. Correct. So the one way to think about it is the prosecutor is choosing how much information to get, right? So that's so I don't so don't tell me too much, right? Well, prosecutor is not right exactly. So so this is this is where the commitment power comes. There was a Supreme Court case saying the prosecutor is not allowed to learn something privately, say that the guy is guilty, and then not show that. So there's a sense in which the law, which was put there in place to protect, provides commitment which might hurt an equilibrium. Yes. Well, he wants to in this case. In this case, he wants to. So, no, no. All I was saying, the fact that he has to release, ex release exculpatory evidence, coupled with the fact that he wants to release the, whatever is the opposite of exculpatory, the culpatory evidence, um, in this case, kind of provides him with commitment. Okay? Some other examples I want to, I wanna, yeah. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And so that's the, that's the IC constraint at the beginning you were, you were mentioning, because comparing to cheap talk, you might know the state, but uh, in cheap talk games, you might have some IC constraints that restrict the set of feasible 
that you can choose. Whereas here you can choose any information structure you want. Yeah, exactly. So another example I think fits well is, for example, deciding a grading scheme. Okay. So suppose that students are either high quality or low quality. Okay, and I'm trying to get them to be hired by, you know, some firm upon graduation, and I get to give them grades. Okay. So then what I might do is I, I might decide on a on a curve and say, okay, it's going I'm gonna decide on a curve where in my world, okay, the truth is this is this is kind of overly discreet for student quality. Truth is 30% of students are good and 70% of students are bad. So there's a natural grading curve that says, okay, you're gonna give A to 30% of students and B to 70% of students. That would be the fair grading scheme. Okay? And if you do the fair grading scheme, you're providing all the information, and this might be uh, good for the employers that know what to do, but you could just decide, actually, university mandates a grading curve, okay, usually they only mandate a max, but where you have to give an A to, to half the people. That might be one way you might want to do it, okay. You might want to do it differently, okay, this is, turns out not to be the best grading curve. The grading curve you want, I'm going to turn out in this example, you want the grading curve where you get, have to give A to 60% of people and you can give Bs to 40% of people. Okay. Why is this grading curve helpful? Well, because with this grading curve, what you're going to do is you're obviously going to give A to everybody that's actually good. But now that's just 30. You need to give, you need to give more A's. How many more A's would you need to give? To get to, get to this grading curve, you need to give exactly three-sevenths of the bad students an A. And if that's what you do, then this grading curve is going to get everybody with an A hired. Okay? And you're getting 60% of people hired. You could never come up with a grading curve that's going to get more than 60% of people hired. And just like our prosecutor in that example could never get the judge to convict more than 60% of people, but he get, can get to 60% with that particular blood test. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, my school is small relative to the hiring. This is, this is Harvard. They're being hired by McKinsey. Yeah. So another example in the prosecutor case would be to say that the city just undersizes the lab relative to demands uh, so that they just can't do blood tests. I'm not sure why you're getting exact asymmetry between the, 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 the accuracy on the R and L then. You either do a blood tester or you don't. And uh, if you don't, it might be because you were just up against this capacity constraint. The but you, will that give you probability of R given R is equal to 1? I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that you're wrong, but I don't see immediately that you're right. Um, all right, uh, let's see. We are going till 10.30, right? Okay, so then let me talk a bit about some extensions because there's a lot of extensions that I think are, are important to make this more realistic and, and, uh, and I'd like to talk at least about two or three of them. And what I'm, what I'm going to mean by extension, I'm going to think about ways in which we could enrich the model and the key question... The question I'll be asking, it's not the only question to ask, is just will the concavification approach still remain in our toolbox as a solution? Obviously, there's lots of extensions we might think of where concavification approach will not persist, but that doesn't mean that we can't study it. We just have to study it using different methods. But I'm curious to what extent the, the lessons I've been stressing today remain even if we generalize the model. So... First thing that there was demand for is let's think about receivers, private information. Okay, and receivers, private information could come in two varieties. Could be private information about the utility function. Okay, I don't know something about their preferences. 
or it could be they might have private information about the state. They get some exogenous signal about the state. Okay, so what I want to claim is that regardless of which variety of private information we get, everything we said goes through very readily with a simple reinterpretation okay, of the, of the, of the v-hat of mu. So we used to have, let me actually write it right now as an integral. Okay, so what we were, um, what we were maximizing previously is v hat of a star of mu comma omega, right? And we wanted to take the expectation of this. Um, well, let's actually just try and write this. Here. We took the expectation of it this way. Okay. Now, let's suppose that there is there's there's uh, private information about about you about the preferences. Where's that going to come in here? In A star. This A star is now actually a function of mu and also some private information. I don't know what that letter is, so I shouldn't have used it, but okay, that letter. Okay, that's our private information. So what do I do? How do I get rid of this? Any ideas? Hmm? Just take the expectation. Suppose I take another expectation. Okay, this was this was our outer expectation of tau, right? That's the resolution of mu. Suppose I now just take the expectation of this sign. Okay. Is everything still okay? Can I write this as a concavification? Yes, I can write still. Sorry, this was this was a V here, right? Sorry, that was a V. I can write, let me, let me say it this way, I can write v hat of mu as being the expectation under mu of the expectation under xi of v of a star of mu xi omega. Hmm? Chi. Chi. Thank you. Kept asking for someone to do it. Kai, perfect. I really should just pick letters I'm familiar with. I don't know why. All right. So does everybody see why this is this is just a very sensible, I'm sorry, very sensible, very obvious reformulation of the value function? I still have a value function over beliefs. It just happens I have to integrate out this this private information to the receiver, but I still end up with some value function. And maybe instead of being a step function, it becomes something like this. That's okay. This has a concavification, and it again has a feature that ex post we're always at beliefs where the function equals the concavification, and I don't want to generate more information. Okay, so that's very easy. What if this, however, is actually um, what if chi is correlated with a state? Okay. Well, in that case. What's going to happen is I have to think about, well, if this is some signalization that the person got. And the whole point is, depending on what signalization people got, not only will that affect their action, but it might affect actually my posterior belief. Okay. So we're going to have to, if Kai generates information about the state, we might want to rewrite this. Okay. So there's various things that we might see. Okay. And then there's going to be not only... You can think of this as the, as, as, as the belief that they would have had without the information. We're going to also have to think about what is my belief okay, about the state given this pair, given I would have had this posterior without the information and the fact that I got this. If I know everything they could possibly see. I know how likely that is. Okay, and that's going to influence also my payoff. But again, there's no problem. Just think about whatever private information that I might have seen. Whatever that is, I can think about, okay, what, is, what are they going to think? I'm going to think the same thing. And we again end up with a value function that might look different, but adding private information is just no problem at all. Okay? Yeah.
Well, I'm here assuming this is private information, so, so I don't actually observe um, what they have. I mean, all I'm saying, so what I was simply suggesting, there's a way of solving a situation where a receiver has private information still by just in this two-step way. First, construct the value function over belief. To do that, you're going to be integrating this private information. And then you still have a value function over beliefs. Go back to the original problem. I'm just saying that, that approach is, is, is still there. Okay? <laughs> Moshe. No, 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 you don't. You don't. Remember, the, whatever receiver knows, it knows. That, that is private information, okay? Once he takes the action, the game's over. But I... I, I agree if you assume that once he takes the action, the game's over. However, in this setting... Correct. If, if, he's a, if I get to see him, if we have some game where he's about to take an action, but he can retract the action, so that's in a way of saying, I, get to, I generate an experiment... Then he tells me something about what he learned and I can generate another experiment. Then it's not obvious I never want to generate a second experiment after he tells me what he learned. Especially if he does that with commitment. That, that's totally true. Yeah. I agree with that. What about some other... Yeah. So it seems, it seems that uh, here there's another crucial assumption that's carried here is that uh, the signal structure is still have to be public regardless of the private information. So suppose that we're ruling out an information technology uh, that, that allows the sentiment to screen over different types. Good. I've, I have not talked about screening. There are people who have worked on the screening problem, and there's a paper by, someone's going to help me remember all the five authors, so <laughs> by, by, by uh, um, Colotillon et al. Um, I, was he the first? Is he the first? Is he the first? Yeah, forget. Milava. So, there's a paper by Colotillon et al showing that if receiver has private information and sender um, can do one of two things, he can just generate a signal or can try and screen and offer a menu of experiments. You get one depending on, on, on what, type of, of what type you report to be. That in fact, trying to screen does not get you a higher payoff than simply um, sort of solving the problem we just discussed. So that's not obvious, and the fact that screening does not help is not something I've showed here at all. That's in that other paper, but uh, screening, in fact, is not, is not helpful here. It's not helpful. It may be helpful in general, but the conditions are... Really Correct. I'm sorry. So I, I, I misspoke. They, they, they're, they're, there are, in the setting they, they consider, screening doesn't help, but, but yes, it certainly might be helpful in general. Yeah. All right. Um, what, do we have, 10 minutes? what else might we want to talk about? We might want to talk about um, costly information. Perhaps it's not cheap to generate this information. Okay? Um, perhaps the um, having a fine grading curve is, is a lot uh, harder for the professor than just giving everybody an A, which is no information. Uh, perhaps generating these, these uh, lab tests, something the prosecutor has to pay for, so who cares about that. What, if you write a general function, some cost of information, okay, even if it's a very well-behaved function, like let's say you know more, you just assume that you know more black or more informal experiments are, are 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 more expensive or something like that. With a general function like this, you will not necessarily be able to go from the problem maximize overall experiments into a problem maximize over distributions of posteriors. Because it's not necessarily the case that two experiments that lead to the same distribution of posteriors have the same cost. Okay. In fact, even if you assume that this cost function has the property <coughs> that if we get to the same tau, the cost is the same, you may be able to write it as max over tau, but you're not going to necessarily be able to get max over 
over tau expectation under tau v hat of mu. You might not be able to get this separability, this, 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 this um, separability across the posteriors in terms of the value. So of course, if you assume that all pi's that lead to the same tau have the same cost, you can get some form that looks like this. But that doesn't have that, you know, this kind of a problem does not allow us to, to, to have the geometric approach of concavification. So what do you need before you can go back to this? What you need is kind of immediately obvious. You need an assumption of the form that C of pi equals the expectation under the distribution of posteriors induced by pi of some cost of getting to a posterior. If you have a cost function that takes this form for some function k, if you can describe the cost of an experiment through the expectation of some function of the posteriors, then you're good. Because if, we, if this v hat still be our old v hat, our problem just became this problem. I can figure out how expensive the experiment was posterior by posterior, and I still have my function to concavify. Now, many natural cost functions do not have this form. Okay, But a lot of the ones that are widely used in some branches of economics today do. So for example, the rational inattention cost function has this form, okay, where k is taken to be entropy. And the cost of getting more information is taken as just the reduction in entropy. Okay, so it's not like this is a totally uh, exotic uh, uh, assumption that would never be satisfied, but it's certainly restrictive. So if you're willing to work with these sorts of cost functions, adding costly information lets you stay within the concavification world. Good? Make sense? What about if we have heterogeneous priors? Okay. Some people might be dogmatically opposed to even listening to this part of the lecture, but suppose for a moment that sender and receiver agree to disagree at the outset about what mu naught is, and instead of mu naught, we have the, the sender's I'll put it up here so it's not confusing. We have a sender's prior and the receiver's prior. Okay, we just agree to disagree. But we all agree if I choose some information structure, we all agree on what that means. We all agree on the likelihood ratios of signal realizations across states. Okay? Can we handle this using the machinery we've discussed today, or does the fact that send and receiver have totally different beliefs means that we're sort of we've got to start from scratch and, and, and think about the problem all anew? Why beliefs match up at all? Ah, what were sender's beliefs anywhere? When I wrote down v hat of mu, what form did it take? What was v hat of mu? It was v of a star of mu, whose belief is this? Receivers. Receivers. Omega, good. All right, so there's no sender's belief there, but remember there was also to the extent that V depends on the state, we have mu of S here. So sender and receiver's beliefs were both in there when they were the same one. So in fact, we're going to have v hat of mu s mu r, which we don't want, because now that's not a space that's, that's the one that we were in. Sender's beliefs matter because they tell us about how he feels about particular actions. When sender, because remember, sender can have a state-dependent utility. That's why sender's beliefs matter. If we had v of a, then sender's beliefs would not, uh, well, I, I don't even want to say that. Sender's beliefs, um, okay, so, so that's the issue, okay, so the reason why this is not going to be a problem, the reason why we can actually easily handle this as well, 
is the fact that if you start with two people, so here's just a question. Suppose we start with two people, mu s with the priors mu s and mu r, and let's say this is all I've told you. All I've told you there's two people. One has a belief s, one has a belief r, and then they both see some piece of information. By piece of information, I just mean something that has a likelihood in each state. And let's say I tell you mu r became mu r, mu r prime, or mu r, mu r hat. I'm telling you what happened to this posterior. Is that enough information for you to tell me what happened to this posterior? And the answer is yes. If you tell me two priors, okay, and you tell me a basin with this prior goes to this posterior, I can immediately tell you what posterior basin with any other, any other prior would go to. Okay, this is suffices for me to figure out what mu hat of s is. Okay, because I can, by looking, at, as, as long as these are interior, of course. If one of these is not interior, then this does not hold. Okay, so we definitely, when we, when we consider heterogeneous priors, they're both in the interior of the state space. There's, they're non dogmatic priors. So this tells me that I can basically write sender's posterior as a function of the receiver's posterior. There's a simple formula for this once you tell me what the difference in the priors are. And therefore, I have a very simple v hat of mu, which I can think of as v hat of mu r, put it right in differently. And just this expectation now needs to be taken with this modified sender's belief, which I can back out from the receiver's belief. And again, we're going to end up just with some value function, which we'll concavify. So heterogeneous priors do not give us any problem in using the concavification machinery. Okay. Um, So these are, I think, some of the most important and best worked out extensions. Ben? Was this assuming some common support of the priors? I, yeah, I think when I said interior, I meant common support. Yeah, common support priors. Otherwise, you can't, uh, yes. Yeah. No, no states are ruled out by um, one and not the other. Yes, yeah, it, there is, exactly. And, but then you don't get this. You, so, there's, so if you don't have common support, then you, then, 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 and, and he does not, of course, solve it using the, the, the concavification argument because the approach now has to, be, has to be different. Yeah, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. I think we're out of time. I'm happy to take any burning questions, but also happy to, to move the conversation to uh, something with, with caffeine. <laughs>